Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, I thank you, the University of Texas Pan American for the kind invitation to come talk to you. And after this delicious first introduction, presentation, we're now going to talk about a more drier <laughs> product, okay? But still very interesting. And um, what I selected today to present to you is um, the um, production of hydrogen and its applications. Today we hear about hydrogen off and on with se several applications, but really uh, we know that hydrogen is used for feed up balloons. Remember the uh, zippelin that actually took um, uh, some kind of a, a risk many, many years ago, and it exploded, right? Um, this, uh, since that, at that time, this uh, Zeppelin was filled up with hydrogen, but despite the fact that the hydrogen at that time was, just today, flammable, it was not the hydrogen that really provoked the accident. It was demonstrated later on, and uh, it was um, in the Smithsonian Museum they remove a plaque that was uh, telling that the reason for the explosion was hydrogen. Actually, at that time, hydrogen was only the lifting uh, element of this uh, vehicle. And uh, uh, it was the components of the material that um, made the Zeppelin, the ones that really created uh, the friction with the air, the friction between the materials in, uh, in this uh, vehicle created sparks. And at that time, the spark, I mean, the materials were used with phosphorus and sulfur and many other components that would provoke uh, a, 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 a sparking situation and, it, and the incident was created that way. Okay, so the Smithsonian um, Museum changed the plate. So hydrogen, yes, it is very explosive, but under certain environments. And the hydrogen also, I would say, that uh, is so light that whenever it escapes into the atmosphere, it shoots directly into the atmosphere very fast, and it forms in the atmosphere without creating that much um, collateral damage. This um, hydrogen is uh, actually used in many, many industries. At the, at, the, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to tell you what are those applications that are very important. But I think today you probably want to know how we made the hydrogen for these applications. Today, hydrogen is like any other uh, utility, is uh, a gas that uh, is consumed in tremendous amount of quantities. And probably the major amount of quantity that uh, um, is used for is that of removing the impurities of sulfur from the oils coming from the ground. That's in refineries. If these oils are not removed, then we would not have the gasolines that we have today. So that's one of the most important applications for hydrogen, but there are other important applications. I'll go with this first. Okay. Well, first of all, um, everything started when I went to the University of New Hampshire, uh, I would say many years ago, when I got introduced to the hydrogen by filling balloons with it. Uh, it was an economical way of doing it um, for parties and for celebrations that we used to have, but uh, the, some of those exploded very easily. Um, because uh, we not, were not careful at that time. And uh, the, the, the thing to do was to use um, helium. But I got some interest in the hydrogen, okay? So, um, my interest already amounts to 30 years experience with hydrogen systems. And uh, we typically learn how to build industrial plants that produce this hydrogen. <clears throat> but first of all, Let's talk a little bit about our company, Pan American Hydrogen, Pan American Enterprises. Um, 
started by being uh, with my with my company myself being a little bit in Quieto, you know, and uh, um, working instead for a large corporation and try to work for myself, he created a company, and uh, this company evolved. Of course, we have had already expertise from previous technologies, which is the purification and the generation of hydrogen with larger companies. But this is the way Pan America grew, uh, uh, was created, and uh, it was 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Uh, our company was created only to uh, market hydrogen generation plants. Since we were all engineers, and I'm an engineer too, uh, we specialize in the design, engineering, manufacturing, and installation of hydrogen plants, all in packaged plants, what we call modular plants, okay? And uh, uh, we learned to do this in such a way that uh, we offer the, the plants in a form that we call it turnkey projects. I'll let you know what it is later on. We sold these plants first in uh, Mexico, Latin America, now the US, and then around the world. Here we go. Now we have all these plants uh, built for all these countries. Uh, the main ones are here in uh, America, Canada, United States, Mexico, South America, and the other plants that we have installed are in uh, the Pacific Rim, and some in Europe already. Um, our company is still small, but because it is small, we move fast, and we can uh, really beat our big uh, co competitors, okay, the big guys. So that's one of the good things that we have on, with this company. Now, imagine we started building smaller plants, which is this little one here, only 200 normal cubic meters an hour, and uh, we translate to um, English units, it is 10,000 standard cubic feet per hour, that we build these plants for the application of hydrogenation of edible oils, vegetable oils. Uh, you remember that um, uh, many years ago, we used to do that here in the States a long time ago, before we, the trans fatty acids um, came into really um, a criticism and the government avoided or uh, tried to forbid to put these materials, hydrogenation uh, vegetable oils into our food. But I guess uh, just as uh, um, the previous presentation say, okay, the, the important thing is that uh, these trans fatty acids also create um, problems with health just uh, uh, as in any people that eat uh, too much of it. Um, today, in other parts of the world, that's, uh, this hydrogenation of vegetable oils are still common, uh, particularly in countries like uh, India, Bangladesh. And they, they don't really care about this, uh, what kind of damage they do to their system, because they are not they they are, they are not heavy, they are not fat. So, um, this is what we started with these little plants many years ago. Then we built plants, larger plants, and as um, the time passed by, we were building larger and larger plants. So you can see that now a plant we have here is a, a plant for a refinery for um, purification of, of oils, of um, refinery oils. Now, the production of hydrogen is very s simple, chemistry. Anybody that has taken chemistry in high school will understand the chemistry for the production of hydrogen. This is one of the production of hydrogen, which is the largest one in the world. Probably 95% of the hydrogen is produced this way. It's called the steam methane reforming or catalytic reforming. And what it does is that we take the, we take actually natural gas. Let me go into the next one. We take natural gas, which is CH4, and we combine it with hydrogen. And as you can see, the the carbon combines with the oxygen of the water and generates CO2 and liberates the hydrogens. So um, this is the typical reaction that we have today. And uh, when we do this in reality, okay, as you know, not all the reactions are 100% converted. So part of it, I would say about 70% of the reaction is executed that way but it comes out with impurities like CO 
and uh, CO2 and methane that did not react and water that did not react. So um, making hydrogen today, people ask me, how come you don't make hydrogen from water? Well, we do. Just like uh, there is a way to do hydrogen, make hydrogen with water via electrolysis, where you split the molecule of water into oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, here is the same thing about the same thing. We split the molecule, except that the oxygen will make it react with methane, with the carbon of the methane, forming CO2, okay, and liberate the hydrogen. Look, the methane has four hydrogens, water has two hydrogens. Okay, so this is a good source of hydrogen. Now, when we come out with these components at the end of the reaction, we, we, we get a bunch of impurities, as I mentioned before, which is CO2, CH4, uh, carbon monoxide, and hydro and water. And um, we have a second reaction that we call it high temperature shift converter with another catalyst. And the CO that did not react in the first reaction is going to react in the second reaction by reacting with water and producing more hydrogen and more CO. Now, all this gas that is generated in this, in this way uh, is passed through a purification system. The purification system, what it does is that it takes all those impurities, it passes, uh, it passes through this uh, bottom of, the, of this uh, vessel with adsorbents, that's adsorbents H1, H2, and H3, they remove the impurities, okay, these impurities, and let the hydrogen go through. This is the way we get hydrogen, in the most economical way. Again, um, there are other ways of making hydrogen, which is solar, by via solar, or electrolysis, or wind. We can do hydrogen, but the, I would say the majority of it is by this steam methane reformer. Okay, now. This is what we do. We take the we take the uh, the natural gas, we clean it, and then we send it to the, this reactor with that is full of, is uh, um, full of catalyst tubes through wh which the natural gas uh, combined with the with the steam is water water in the form of steam make the reaction. It create this uh, reformate the one that I mentioned to you, and go through the secondary reaction and get the processed gas, crude gas, and then goes to the purification system and produces the high purity hydrogen. Now, there is, a, there is some uh, gases that are called waste gases. They still have hydrogen, still have um, uh, methane and CO. So these gases we use to power with heat okay, the reactor. So it's a very, very efficient way of producing hydrogen because it's self-sustaining and we do not have to add more heat, uh, um, external heat to this, but because we produce 90% of the heat required for this reaction here with the, with the waste gas. All right, now I'm going to go very fast on this because the relevant parts of the hydrogen plant, as you can see, even though the reaction is very simple, you have, to, you have to design the system with so many safeties, okay? So much instrumentation that will always take care of any potential um, incident that might happen into the, in the plant, like a rupture of a catalyst tube in the heat system, a rupture of any, any vessel or anything. The plant will be shut down immediately and it is fully protected. That's why today making hydrogen is very safe. That's, of course, um, aided by the technology that has been developed over many, many years with instrumentation that follow the process of this system. Um, so we kill safety and control. We put lots of alarms and shutdowns and pressure safety devices. And incidentally here, this is what I like to uh, mention that is uh, really exciting to design these units because it involves many disciplines. It involves disciplines of ele electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, control engineering, safety engineering. Everything is uh, poured into, all kinds of engineering is poured into this kind of design of these plants. So when um, 
uh, we put this uh, together, um, we also put a control system that gives us diagnostics and calibration. And also, the control system is so designed that it will tell you exactly when to produce 100%, you can produce 50% or 80%, and also when some of the control systems like valves or instrumentation that is controlling the process is, um, is, is failing, is falling out of, 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 of the range. So uh, we use a program that is very powerful to uh, let, us, let the, the, the operator know what's going on without having to shut down the plant. In the past, the instrumentation will fail uh, it will be identified uh, through the system and the plant will shut down. And if that's the case, the, the, imagine a company building or uh, producing steel or glass, they have to, if the plant shuts down, they have to shut down their, their furnaces. Very, very expensive. So we prevent this by taking care of this with these uh, powerful programs. Uh, of course, we use the best catalysts in the, in the market uh, best absorbent for purif purification. And it's very important also to know the metallurgy because this reaction that I mentioned to you in the, in the first phase reactor um, is ex it's done at around uh, 1,800 degrees, 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit. Very hot and also a high pressure. So you can imagine that that kind of uh, um, situation you need a very, very reliable metallurgy. So metallurgy is very important, okay? And this is when the metallurgies also come into, into play. Um, well, by this, by, by this kind of uh, discipline, okay, putting all these disciplines together, we design plants that go from the small capacity, as I said, 10,000 standard cubic feet per day, or half a million of uh, cubic feet per day, all the way to 13, 20 million. Um, we produce the sign locally in our own office. And uh, when the plants grow bigger, we ask uh, help to engineering companies. And um, we, we finish the plant and we install it. And there you have an installed plant. This is the way the plant installs. Here is the reactor, the large reactor, a small reactor, you don't see it's in between these uh, piping sections. And then here is the purification system. This plant was built for, uh, for a country in Europe, Spain. Now we have gone through larger plants and we do design these um, first into uh, into your own system by using a AutoCAD. An AutoCAD plant 3D, you probably know about, you probably have been in contact with this powerful uh, software. Gives us the, the capability of simulating in a graphic way every single uh, process equipment, um, piping and instrumentation. And this, when it goes to the, to the shop, to be manufactured, and we have a manufacturing shop in Harlingen, where we do most of this uh, equipment. It ends up like this installed. Okay, uh, today um, we have very capable engineers uh, working with us, and we're always looking for more people, young uh, uh, engineers coming from the universities, or beginning their courses in engineering in the university so they can come and learn with us, okay? It's a very exciting um, kind of career. So uh, we can go and find another one, another example. This is again an AutoCAD uh, design, and this is the end, the, 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 the end part of it, which is a plant already is totally installed. Uh, this is one of the largest plants that we have built it's a 12 million standard QFD day plant. Now, now we know what the, the hydrogen does, how the hydro, how hydrogen is, is produced, and which kind of plants we build to produce this industrial hydrogen. Now, um, the importance of this hydrogen in today's industry 
cons in its uses and applications. Uh, let me just mention a few of them, okay? Energy. Uh, hydrogen is used, is used to produce electricity to power communication towers. In areas, many countries that do not have the capability of, you know, the, the, the power lines to feed the towers, they have to bring, uh, I'm talking about towers, communication towers for cellular phones, okay? They have to generate the hydrogen or the electricity right there. Um, there are many ways of generating electricity. One of them is by bringing a, a, uh, uh, a, a power generator, you know, a gas power generator, a gasoline or diesel power generator, except that um, in many of these towers, uh, it's to no avail because uh, the, the towers shut down one day when people steal the generators. So by the time they replace the generator, many people get without you know, out of contact, out of touch for many, many years or weeks. So by bringing a system that uses hydrogen, people are really afraid of touching the hydrogen system. So it, it generates power, it generates electricity, so the, so the towers keep on going, okay? That's one of the applications. And also in, in, in other countries where um, energy is very expensive, let's talk about Europe, hydrogen is used a generate hydrogen generator, small hydrogen generator is put in a condominium area, for example, and this hydrogen is fed into fuel cells and generate electricity for the condominium. And at the same time, the system generates water, uh, hot water, and uh, uh, to heat up the, 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 con the, the housing in the condominiums. And also the water is very pure water that you can use for many ways, you know, for the gardens or anything else. Now, um, uh, the, the one that I mentioned before, refinery gas processing, uh, hydrogen is essential. Even today, you know, today they are built, they are, they are producing um, fuel oils, no, uh, oils, yes, from uh, um, bio, uh, uh, in the bio industry. Um, they have developed the technology to produce uh, fuels from uh, wood chips, for example, okay, from other organic materials, leftovers, oils that are left over in the, uh, in the industry, either, either uh, uh, um, edible oils or any other oils like the, oils, the mineral oils from your cars. Well, um, these uh, companies that have developed now these technologies, and you probably hear more about the bio, uh, bioengineering, biodiesel, biotechnologies, to generate uh, the fuels, hydrogen is very important. Without hydrogen, they cannot refine the products. Aerospace, you already know that the um, rockets use uh, hydrogen, but also in the today's electrical power generation uh, um, units, they use a lot of, uh, by turbine, you know, the turbines that generate the power, um, they have, to, they have to work under a very um, uh, lean atmosphere. Uh, what do I mean by lean atmosphere? Well, a lean atmosphere is with low density atmosphere. Why? Because if they, uh, these turbines uh, rotate in an environment like, like, is, like air, you know, air um, is heavy compared to hydrogen, and uh, it heats up rapidly, it's very inefficient system, but if you fill up these casings with hydrogen, hydrogen is very, um, very light, and more than that, is uh, an excellent gas to quench the, the system. So we have some small generators that uh, power this, uh, that feed this, uh, uh, these casings, these turbines, so they can operate properly. Um, we can name transportation as you can imagine, in, in, in different ways. Today, they even are using uh, hydrogen systems with fuel cells uh, to install in uh, forklifts or all these vehicles in the, at the airports. And it's going very well. They don't, they don't need any more pollution. In fact, these airports, many airports in the, in the country are committed to eliminate the gasoline um, forklifts 
or vehicles, so they're using fuel cells with nitrogen. But other industries that use hydrogen, for example, the chemical industry, hydrogen is used uh, to produce nylon. All the nylon that you find and all the fibers that you have is produced, they, they use hydrogen to produce it, to get the larger molecules. And uh, um, in fact, uh, I would say a major producer of uh, uh, tires in the world uses nylon. So you just imagine that most of the nylon, most of the uh, nylon that comes in your tires has been produced with hydrogen too. And electronics, the wafers and the computer chips, they have to be uh, produced with, high, with a hydrogen and inner atmosphere, not inner, but also reducing atmospheres. It's a, inner and reducing atmosphere is a combination of nitrogen and hydrogen. Without that, you will not have the quality um, of the chips that we use in our computers. That's very important. Flat glass, for example. Flat glass, you know, all the glass that used in the buildings also uses hydrogen. Because many years ago when they wouldn't do that, I don't, I don't know if you, you, you younger generation probably don't remember, but I remember that um, in many of our, our windows in the, uh, when, we, when we use this flat glass, they had some kind of stars in the middle. Well, those were made by bubbles, oxygen bubbles, <coughs> imperfections in the glass. So <coughs> to eliminate that, they use hydrogen. For the production of stainless steel, to get the polishing of the stainless steel, use hydrogen, <coughs> where the oxygen reacts with the, with the hydrogen and gives that finishing, that perfect finishing, the stainless steel. In pharmaceuticals, well, another example is the production of Tylenol. You guys know Tylenol, so hydrogen is used to this, uh, to produce this kind of product. And uh, even, you know, hydrogen is a renewable product. <laughs> this is one of the things that you will have to face, most of the, you, you engineers will have to face in the future. Uh, how are you are going to resolve the problems of the pollution? Well, most of the, most of the pollutants, the greatest pollutant that we have is CO2. Well, there are many ways to um, sequestrate the CO2 today liquefy it or send it pressurized on the ground to, to eliminate it from the atmosphere and not drop it into the atmosphere. Well, um, there are some technologies, like one we know by hypersolar, you can go to the internet and, hide and find it, where they have a system where they, they, produce, they, they use hydrogen to combine it with the CO2. It's a reverse uh, reaction to what we were talking about and this creates methane and water. And this methane, or this natural gas, is of high quality and can be put in a pipe, in a pipeline, just like the one we use today. But this is a challenge for you guys. That's lots of engineering needs to be developed for this kind of process. But there are some ways to get things resolved into this world and avoid the, 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 the um, contamination that we have today. All right. Well, this is all my presentation today. And uh, I thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to respond. So uh, this is a fantastic presentation. I wasn't aware that you guys were over in Harlingen. So can oh, you tell yes. us a little bit more about the company, how many employees you have? And I mm -hmm. imagine with all those installations around the world, you spent most of your time going to Malaysia and, and everywhere else around the world to facilitate that. That's right, yes. Um, you know, when you are a small company, you want to grow and, 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 and uh, compete with the larger companies. Uh, somebody calls you from Malaysia or from Indonesia or from China or from Africa and say, hey, we need a quotation for a hydrogen plant. We say, sure, you know, <laughs> and we, can, we can build a plant for you, wherever it is, wherever you go. Um, Yes, uh, we are in Harlingen. We, right now we have staff 25 people because uh, we are in the low, uh, in the low business uh, uh, period. Uh, but uh, it goes very quick, you know. We uh, think that probably by the end of this year we'll end up acquiring our three projects, three hydrogen plants, 
And then this is when we get our people. We get uh, welders, pipe feeders, uh, electricians, <laughs> everything. Uh -huh. Plus more engineers, draft, uh, drafting people. And uh, uh, the last project that we uh, made uh, made us hire up to 150 people. Okay, and uh, pe those people were utilized to put together the plant, to weld the plant, cut the pipe, set, uh, uh, feed it, and weld it, put it, the skids together, and then we selected a team of about 30 or 40 people to take it with us to the field to install the plant there. Yeah. The I was going to say, the way you actually make these is you kind of make the plant in Harlingen and then you yeah. disassemble it and, and go to Africa or Malaysia or whatever and reassemble it there? Exactly. That's the, that's the benefit of building the plant in modules or in skis. So we can set it any place around the world. Wow. And yes, go ahead. How long does it take to assemble and disassemble before you ship it? All right. Well, first of all, uh, let me just add this to the question, okay? It takes about 12 months to, to, to put the plant together, all the equipment, to assemble it. 12 months. Design, between design, and uh, cutting, and fitting, and welding, uh, plus the engineering, of course. And then uh, buying the instrumentation, we have to buy instrumentation, and, and uh, uh, insert it into the, into the system, as well as rotating equipment and uh, valves control system and everything else, that takes about 12 months for a medium-sized plant. For a larger plant, it takes about six, uh, 16 months to 18 months, much larger plant. So what we do is that uh, um, just to, uh, that's what it takes to assemble it, okay, all together. It's assembling it, it probably takes only a few weeks. But then putting it back together, it will take about uh, probably four to eight weeks in the field, and then what we do after that is that we proceed to do something that's called commissioning. The commissioning of the plant, once it is all assembled, that uh, uh, consists of uh, uh, testing, the, 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 testing the, the instrumentation, testing the rotating equipment, loading the catalyst, and uh, that's the commissioning. And then once we do that, we start, we proceed to the start -off. The startup is turning the, the, the reformer, the, for, the furnace, the fire fire, that's a big event. Everybody gets, you know, all nervous, you know, doesn't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the natural gas coming in. And uh, the, uh, but everybody gets, you know, right on the toes. And, and it, it's exciting, you know, to see these people, you know, watching, you know, like a, a rocket, turning the rocket, going up in an end. And then you have to control it, to control the, they control the, the fire inside the, the reformer, make, it, make sure that it has the proper size flame and high flame and, and there is no offset so you don't, you don't destroy your system, your tools, your catalyst tools. And uh, uh, that, that part takes about uh, uh, another uh, eight weeks altogether. And once we are producing hydrogen, because I, I don't want to go through the process because it's complicated, of, uh, uh, initiating the production of the process, but to, once we started uh, putting natural gas and, and, and steam and start producing crude hydrogen and send it to the purification system and produce pure hydrogen, then we do something that's called tuning. And we tune the plant to, to make sure that it, it operates correctly at 50%, at 70 or 80%, at 100%, and then the plant is ready to give it to the customer. Yes? How long can you store hydrogen? Uh, Obviously, the, the, the amounts of hydrogen that, that your customers need is, you know, the, where they need the, the actual uh, the facility to make the hydrogen. Why, why aren't you selling the tubes of hydrogen to them, like massive tubes of hydrogen, and keep on reselling those tubes and re recycling it with them? Right, uh, because of economics. It's very expensive to sell hydrogen in a high pressure uh, cylinders. Okay. You probably have seen the the, the two trailers, long two trailers, 40 feet long, and they have cylinders about this diameter, and they have a, 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 like a bunch there, like about eight, nine tubes in the in the in the flat bed. Well, they only carry a uh, few cubic meters of hydrogen, high pressure. It will be extremely expensive. So even for a small 
for the smallest plant, okay, it's more economical to build a small plant than carry this hydrogen uh, by, by tubes. That is done only when hydrogen is used in a very small quantities. So, um, and not only that, for safety reasons. <laughs> See, uh, sometimes what they do is that uh, uh, to carry more hydrogen, they liquefy it. But imagine they still to, leak, to produce the hydrogen in gas, to pressurize it, to liquefy it, to store it in a, in a, in a cryogenic system, and then truck it to the, to the customer. And the customer has to do the, again the vaporization and to, contain, to uh, put it at the, at the pressure that they need to use it. So that's very expensive too. So it's better to put the hydrogen plant on site. What's the smallest plant that you can build? Would it be possible to build one that would fit in an international shipping container? Um, the answer is yes. Now, um, it, is, it is possible, but now what we do is that uh, below the capacity that I mentioned here, okay, which is smallest, 10,000 standard cubic feet per hour, um, below that capacity, we recommend to use the production of hydrogen via electrolyzer. When you, you plug the, the unit and uh, through an electrolyte, which is solid today, in a fuel cell that's today, you produce generate electricity. Well, the reason I ask is because you're making it clear that, that your model here really isn't very scalable in terms of uh, building your company really big. Uh, and I was thinking of the way that they do computer centers nowadays where they ship the entire rack of computer center stuff in a shipping container that they just put down and use it in situ. They don't even unpack it. Right. And if you could do something like that, you could do all of your feed tuning here and then just ship them out and use them with, without having to send your big team of 40 people out to do all those uh, pre-installation checks that you're talking about. That, that's correct. That's for larger units. For smaller, smaller units, we already have a system that fits of this, this size, okay, just bring it into the, uh, in, the in the offshore platform or in a ship or something like that, and then um, just plug it in and you get hydrogen. So it is entirely possible. And uh, what we do today is that we containerize those those uh, systems and sell them to customers like power uh, like the power uh, generation <laughs> companies. They use it, and uh, we can do that too. Do you do uh, any remote diagnostics and, and all the tuning remotely, or does it have to be in person? Is, is that, that's a very good question. You know, we have we, we have plants in Pakistan, okay. We have plants in Ukraine today, for example, in Spain. And uh, what we have done is we have installed a system so we can see the plant operating and control it right from here. Yeah, remote control. So. Uh, we can troubleshoot those plants. If they have a problem, and they call us, and they say, well, just let's connect each other, and we see how it's operating, and then we give recommendations. They can do that themselves. We train them to, to do that. So, uh, yes? Um, what opportunities do you currently have for internships or student involvement or projects that you can give students to like, get involved from like ETPA or you know, anybody that is interested in like, getting more involved with hydrogen, I guess? Is there like community involvement or outreach in the company at the moment? Uh, I would say yes, okay, but we need to develop. We need to develop. We need to talk to the. We need to talk to the. Uh, um, to the schools, to the universities, and come up with a package that actually just an idea. Okay, let's say that we want to make the hydrogen car here, okay, in the area. Put one together. Well, let's do it with the with the university, okay. Let's put it together, let's put all these uh, engineering uh, disciplines together to put something together. First of all, to build the generation unit, and then like a, a hydrogen fuel, fuel station, and then we can fill up the car. Or a tractor, or a uh, vehicle, like a, a forklift, or anything. So, yeah, there are projects like that. In addition to that, we would like to uh, well, there is tremendous amount of opportunities to do hydrogen, okay? And there are, there, there are also some programs uh, nationwide where we can uh, get together with the universities, 
enter into a competition for a project that they are coming out. So there are opportunities, yes. Do you know if the SpaceX program needs hydrogen? Um, unfortunately, not. <laughs> 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 See, um, they, they decided that they were going to use uh, liquid methane, uh, LNG, and uh, oxygen. Well, couldn't you use this to create the methane based using your hydrogen? Yes, it is. It depends on how you design it. Oh. But apparently, it is more. It is. Um, it is more economical to use as it for them for their, their size, okay, of uh, rockets, uh, methane that will give enough power to bring this uh, up to the stratosphere. But eventually, they will use hydrogen. <laughs> yes, sir. Sí, sí habla español, ¿verdad? Así es, sí, sí. Okay. Eh, le iba a preguntar sobre la hidrogenación de aceites para convertirlos a, a, a grasa saturada. Es una práctica que se ha utilizado mucho en la industria alimenticia. Yes, uh, yeah, the question was that the hydrogen that is used to uh, hydrogenate vegetable oil is still a practice or has it been used in the past? Uh, la respuesta es sí. Uh, como mencionaba antes, as I mentioned before, it is still used in many countries, African countries, for example, where they don't have the problem of, of uh, you know, the the problem that you mentioned here this morning this in, the, in the first place. Uh, these people don't have anything to eat, they eat anything. They, 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 they need the grease, they need anything. Whether it is with transparent or not, they still use it. The only place where they don't use hydrogen for to hydrogenate vegetable oils is here in the States or in Europe or maybe Japan. In, in, in Europe, ya no existen desde hace como siete años. That's correct, yes. Yes, that's correct. But you know, uh, they still use the hydrogenation. Todavía usan la hidrogenación of vegetable fats for uh, for animal for animal uh, feed. Okay. okay, they still do that. Okay. And I would say that uh, even the companies today, like Carhill and all those ADMs, they still do uh, use hydrogenation in small quantities to formulate, para formular sus grasas, they still use hydrogenated oil, okay. minimum quantities, okay? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, and how close are we to uh, getting this to be used in uh, like subdivisions for homes or residential areas and make it feasible to, to do that? Today, to it's feasible. We know that it's feasible because it's been done in Europe and it's been done in other countries, okay? Um, it is a matter of um, getting an institution okay, to uh, put together all the resources with all these technologies that we have and then put it to work, make it possible. Like, uh, for example, university, they has a, a housing community for students. That's perfectly, it's a perfect uh, place to do it. Yeah. We put this, uh, we put this, install a small hydrogen plant, generate hydrogen, and produce electricity through fuel cells for the for the community. I'm sorry, I don't follow that. Don't, don't you have to put as much energy in as you get out? Where's the where's the energy coming from? Unless you're talking about using uh, methane again, in which case burn it directly. Well, exactly. Well, the thing about this, you have to use methane, natural gas, okay? Uh, the reason for using natural gas is because it is inexpensive, and when you generate electricity power from that uh, from that form, it's very very competitive with the grid. But no, you don't only generate a power, but also generate, as I said, heat to heat homes during the winter, and also generate some water, pure water that you can use for something else. Yeah. You can use for very pure coffee. Right, so that benefits the methane. What's the point of turning into hydrogen and then burning it? Well, you don't burn the hydrogen. Well, what do you do with it then? You put, you put the hydrogen through fuel cells. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that what it's for? Yes. A fuel cell will, will convert it into power. And that's a very effective way. You don't combust it. 
Combustion is a very inefficient way of producing energy. But you do it with a fuel cell, it is much more efficient and clean. So, yes. What is a fuel cell? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, a fuel okay. cell. Okay, a fuel cell is nothing else but uh, uh, a unit that has uh, um, two uh, an anode and a cathode. If let's say imagine a box like this, you have an anode and a cathode. Probably no, no, not too big. Anode and cathode. Okay. Here you have a solution, electro, an electrolyte solution. Okay. Now, when you uh, when you put uh, current in one of these and an anode and the other cathode, okay, it, it it creates a dissociation of the water and hydrogen. Now, this is the old way of doing generating hydrogen with by via electrolysis. Today they use something that's uh, it's called fuel cell. It was invented by the NASA. Instead of having a solution, a, pot a potassium solution here in the in between, they reduce this thing to very minimum, and they use some uh, uh, some polyfiber poly uh, fiber uh, material that has the same the same functions as does the same function, same capability. So when you put uh, uh, when you put uh, um, the, the 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 hydrogen in one way, it takes this this what this electrolytic uh, uh, um, electrode takes the hydrogen, strips the strips the electron from the hydrogen, and that electron is what creates the electricity. The electron the the electron the proton actually hydrogen proton which is passive, no electron anymore goes through the electrolyte here, goes to the other electron, and combines with with oxygen. Okay? And when it combines with oxygen, it's, a, it's a passive hydrogen with oxygen from the atmosphere, and it generates water. And, and it, that all creates a stream of power. And that's what generates the electricity. In fact, this is the kind of electricity that's used in, in uh, submarines, for example in uh, uh, many other uh, offshore uh, installations. And that's what it is. You, I, I recommend you to go to the internet. There's a lot of information about that. Thank okay. you. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes.